Energy of photons is larger than the band gap. Obviously, it's most likely. And right now, let's assume there are no carriers in the conduction band. Then, a hole which is bound electron here may actually jump to energy H nu. This is say H nu. Creating an electron here and hole here. So we say whenever photons strike, depends on the absorption they have, and if the energy is absorbed, obviously some of the carriers may holes may get. I mean, electrons in valence band get excited, and they may create electron hole there. But the electron which is received there has an energy of h nu. Is that clear? But according to our theory of semiconductors, uh, for that matter, any material, the electrons will not remain at the highest energy. They will try to occupy lowest energy state if it is available to you. In that case, let's say it is available at E C, the so electrons will actually come down 
from its higher energy the lower energy because it try to occupy the lowest energy state which is the law of thermodynamics it says so second law of thermodynamics says so that the entropy has to be minimized so that the level at which energy is equipartition must come there. if that is the theory then we say okay electrons have come here and let us say you remove h nu okay some electrons gone but let we are looking only one electron for the case and it has already lost some energy okay and it has come to conduction it is also possible that this electron which is there and since there is no way it remains there permanently because there is no reason why it should remain in the conduction band if there is no force being applied on it so it is likely and that's the probability this electrons may fall back to the valence band and then we combine with the holes and we are back to the square one so there are two processes have taken place the first process is called generation so in the first case when you shine h nu greater than eg the electron hole pairs are generated so the process is generation the second is relaxation the higher energy electrons fall to the lowest energy state they relax they lose energy okay. and finally they may actually fall back to the valence band and this as i say is generation term so this term essentially called recombination term So we have three processes we are going through: generation, relaxation, and recombination. So whenever excess carriers are generated by any such optical energy, or for even heat can do that, such electron hole pairs may be formed, but will try to go to which state they like to go to? Thermal equilibrium number. Because you have got more than an I, an I will always there. you have got more than that but system doesn't like to remain in non equilibrium if you are removing light system should go back to thermal equilibrium so the carriers come back whatever excess you said and they will again you will become material entropy or entire or beta whichever is the material you come back to its original thermal equilibrium value this is essentially why you cannot see large number of generation of electrons even in thermal case so otherwise the material is 300 degree kelvin 27 degree centigrade may give you sufficient kd for you but not sufficient in fact 0.025 ev this is 1.1 ev i told you this problem 1 kt is 0.025 ev and band gap is 1.1 ev why electron going there but there is an issue some day before the force and i'll answer it Okay, assuming they go there, they keep going. Then there is no bar on that. The bar comes from the because equilibrium has to be attained. The reverse process actually bring back many of them back to the valence band and recombination starts. So the two processes which are balancing each other is essentially generation and recombination. That brings you thermal equilibrium. So if you disturb the thermal equilibrium, the system will then become in non-equilibrium situation. but then there is a possibility that the rate with which generation occurs and rate with which recombination occurs may have some fixed values so what may happen there may be some generation going on additionally over recombination let's say generation is higher than recombination so some may remain still in conduction band they may not recombine but that number may remain constant because generation recombination is trying to balance at a given time the number is fixed is that clear if you see for a long time and the system has to return to thermal equilibrium yeah this max whatever excess you have created will finally fall back to thermal equilibrium this is essentially what we call steady state in which we say the system is time invariant though you are actually shining process is time dependent but after a while we may say whatever is generated partly is lost so a system remains in pseudo equilibrium or quasi equilibrium 
Is that correct? But it is not in equilibrium with the strong thermal, you have applied energy. However, system remains from an outsider as if it is constant. I gave an example that day, you have a pipe of water in which water is entering. So water is a, has a flow, there is a flow rate, velocity with which water is entering. But after a while, if you see a pipe, you see as if the water is steady there. Essentially, the rate at which it was entering, the rate at which it has come out. You say steady state has maintained there. So steady state is not time, in, in the sense it's a time system, but variation with time is zero. Is that correct? This is relevant for all our device property, I mean device theory. So we want, we will apply biases, we will apply some light, we will apply something. So system will get non-equilibrium. But it may reach a steady state in which the time invariant part we can actually say equal to zero. Is that correct? However, during this when this time invariant is not there, we like to see what happens. How the carriers may decay with time. Because you want to reach to equilibrium, but how much is the time taken to do this must be related to rate with which generation recombination is taking place. Is that correct? So this is what we say excess carrier theory which we want to generate. We want to know how many carriers are generated, how many carriers recombine, what is the way they will recombine, what is the time they will take to recombine. Let's look up any situation. If you are larger number, you are smaller number, which process will immediately try to help you? Diffusion, because it doesn't like non-equilibrium uh, non situation. So there are many processes which are actually helping you. Is that clear? To bring back equilibrium status. Now this is another issue. That means the rate with which recombination generation is happening has also something to do with the process of diffusion if numbers are changing. Is that correct? And so we want to know this relationship with so called this time business with the diffusion itself. Is that clear? This essentially what we are going to calculate in later is called continuity equation. That is our major interest to know how much carriers actually will flow at a given this when the gradients are created by not by us but by shining. Okay. So if the gradients are created, diffusion will start. Is that correct? This processes which we are, are essentially going to correlate the process of recombination generation with the theory of diffusion which we already see now. This essentially is required because in real life I may pump the electrons or holes by some other technique as well but then system has to get back to equilibrium and diffusion must help us out. Is that clear? So this, now few things you must know. So I am talking of some time derivative system, dn by dt or dt by dt, but I am also talking as if carriers are diffusing in lengths. Carriers diffuse means they will move in the length. So there is something space-time relationship is what we are looking into, okay. And to preempt that value which I am really going to get for you is diffusivity of electrons or holes is essentially dn tau n is ln square or similarly for holes. We are going to try to get this relation. dn is the diffusion constant for electrons. Tau is the lifetime. Now what is the word lifetime? We say we like to see before they recommend how much characteristic time it has. When they are decaying, they will decay some characteristic time that we call as its lifetime. So d into tau, tau is time dependent term, the diffusivity is also time dependent centimeter square per second and therefore it has a unit of length square and therefore the length and diffusion which is now coming is getting related to time terms and this is what we are here with. Is that clear? So my, why I showed you this experiment when I derive that I want to tell you why I am doing all this because I, at the end I want to relate if I pump an electron across some point at a, during timing, steady state may achieve but carriers will move and if carriers move, how do they profile, how do they do? Because if I know the profile, what do I get? If I know the variation of holes or electrons along the x, what do I get? 
dn by dx or dp by dx and therefore which currents the diffusion currents so i want to correlate this process with diffusion currents is that clear so this all this big talk i gave you just to give a preamble to what i am deriving because i want to derive this relationship so that i can correlate timing essentially with the space part okay uh, just for the sake of completeness if i follow the book okay i will say some things i am yesterday of course i read some books so one of them this part which i am now talking is from skitman so we say if i0 is the intensity striking a material at x is equal to 0 and let's say this is an element dx okay so i have to say this value is x plus dx okay and this direction is x then we can say intensity of light in this direction di x by dx rate of, as i said depends on the thickness how much is dx you are assuming however one must say the change in intensity will be proportional to available intensity at x is equal to 0 and as we always do that is equal to minus alpha times where alpha is proportional to constant so what is the solution of this will be i is equal to i0 yes e to the power minus alpha x so what are we trying to say if the material is very long x is equal to infinity how much will be intensity if x is equal to infinity that is this is long enough oh yeah yeah what i x thing but and the boundary condition is that x is equal to 0 i is i 0 okay and at x is equal to infinity how much is the intensity of the material is very thick all the intensity will go to 0 which is also obviously seen from there okay. and at x is equal to 0 i is i 0 okay thanks so this means depending on the material alpha is a material property it's a related to call absorption coefficient alpha is called absorption coefficient so depending on the material this alpha may change so whatever is the thickness uh, intensity you say at a distance depending on the alpha it will give some other intensity when it comes out or at any x you want to evaluate is that correct? so let's say if the length is l instead of this say total length is l then we say it is e to the power minus alpha l This is the intensity at a distance L. You can always calculate how much is the intensity within the material. Is that correct? Any point? Is that correct? This is what we are going to use in our all calculation. Okay. So what are we trying to say? If I shine a semiconductor by a optical uh, intensity beam of h nu energy. then the light intensity which will come out of this is essentially because of what ehp is created because of what photons because of photons you will see light outside the material now and that is function of the initial photons entering the other side so the lumen this is the light which is coming is called luminescence is called luminescence we have seen some devices already in your lab leds it has luminescence it shines so the luminescence is which kind it is since i am shining photons and i am seeing the light at the other side it's related to photo so it's called photoluminescence the first which light you see you shine light and the other side you also see a sign as i say the wavelength may or may not change assuming right now no but it is at least you see wavelengths other side coming and depending on which formula or how much intensity will be decided by alpha and the distance you are looking is that clear so the first luminescence which we observe in materials is called photoluminescence is that clear 
if this material has a property that it actually takes long time to recombine so what will happen you will see light after some more time what is this property called phosphorescence okay that is what you see when you go to a mini science uh, exhibitions you stand there for a while it shifts off the light and after some time actually image appears there okay that is essentially phosphorescence so this two things which you have already seen in your second for 11 cells every standard the reason is obviously the light get absorbed and partly it is transmitted out now this luminescence is observed because of excitation of photon beam we call it photoluminescence photo lumine the spelling is too tough due to photon excitation the so excitation is photon instead of photon beam what actually photon was giving energy energy can be given by anything so let's say i have an electron beam okay which is excited because electron has energy if i shine electron beam both electron will interact with the valence electron and still may create electron hole pair them is still will combine and you will see the light now coming because of excitation of what kind electron beam shining so if you see a photo luminescence due to electron beam shining it is called what is it called cathode luminescence due to electron beam shining excitation instead of electron beam let's say i inject what is the material i inject constant current that is i inject current inside this okay. so the third possibility there is a what is called electroluminescence It is due to current excitation so there are three possible luminescence you may see one due to photon excitation the other due to electron beam excitation and third is due to in the case of old cathode ray tube which some of you uh, our old scope still has Can I have now LCD screens? So what luminescence you are expecting there? Cathode. There is an electron gun which actually hits the material, and you see cathode luminescence. Is that correct? That's why after some time you used to see that black tube tube used to get black, and no cathodes were emitted enough, so that the picture tube used to be replaced. Okay. After nowadays. Uh, most of your houses may not have old uh, Sony or other TV. You may have now LCD, LED. By the way, just for the heck of it, what is the difference between LCD and LED display? Think of it. Why will I ask you? LED displays are much costlier. At least one and a half times, two times of that of LCD. Same size displays. Maybe at the end of the course I'll show you. Actually, there is not much a difference. Why they are charging so much? It is only a fooling people. Of course, it has an advantage, but uh, I don't feel the kind of thing they are putting to create, create, convert, convert an LCD to LED should be taken. They are charging for the technology which they invented 28 years ago, okay. and still charging you. Okay. So, okay. So, is that correct? So, now in this, please, the interesting thing now. Our assumption was, please. our assumption was in this all luminescence experiments that electrons fall back from the conduction band to the valence band okay 
and recombine. This is called direct recombination. What kind of recombination? Electrons fall from the conduction band to the valence band. Direct recombination. Is that clear? However, in the case of silicon, okay, you never see any light. This is the issue now. If the electrons fall from conduction band to the valence band, I have not seen silicon LEDs in which light is emitted. Okay. So why it is not emitted? That means there is something more to it in this fall also. Is that clear to you? There is something more to it in the fall. First thing you can understand is silicon and other materials like gallium arsenide, gallium indium arsenide or something gallium phosphides. These material is different by what? What property? Direct band gap. So if we actually plot their EK diagrams, what is EK essentially tells? Relationship between what and what? Energy and momentum. So if I show this is my conduction band and let's say this is my valence band A, A, E. Then an electron at the lowest energy state may actually fall at the lowest, highest energy state for the valence band and the energy is essentially the difference between the two called the band gap because momentum is always conserved because with the same momentum it is falling down. Okay. Two things I said you when process is kinetic what two things should satisfy? Energy should be conserved so is the momentum be conserved. Now, of course, there is all assumptions still elastics, okay, but assume that. There are many issues if we don't take it. This is all this material in which there is a direct band gap. Like as I say, the first being gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide and many others. All these materials have a direct band gap. So when the recombination will take place, they will lose energy only. Is that correct? They will satisfy momentum without anything, so they will only lose energy. And energy is expressed in what way? The photon energy. So if I shine or whatever process I do here, and if I see here, then obviously light will come out. Is that correct? So we say whenever there is a direct band gap, emission will be, luminescence will be seen simply because momentum need not be conserved, self conserved. However, if you have a material like in silicon, of course it, it may be different values but take an example, where along the 1 1 or many times 1 0 or some of the values may be along 1 1 0, what does that direction mean? The momentum is different for balance band electrons and that of conduction band electrons. So in most cases when the energy is lost, it is lost in the form of vibrations and they are called which particles represent the energy? Phonons. So in the case of all indirect band gap semiconductors, the emission will not be seen photons, it is only Phonon, which is, but phonon is not visible. So what you will actually see in the material, it get, no vibrations. You can't, they don't vibrate with the frequency which is seen by eye. Vibrations when absorbed by the material, what do they give? Heat. So the material becomes heated and it does not show you any luminescence. That's why there is no silicon LEDs. Okay. Of course, recently they have come, but some other. That's why I want to tell you why they could be good. Is that correct? So what we say, if I say now, if such materials are to be converted into pseudo direct band gap materials, an indirect band gap material by making some compound semiconductors or add something which allows me, and here is that theory which I am interested in, let us say I have a energy level in the band gap. Normally band gap does not have any energy level but let's say I add something which has an energy level in the band gap which can be closer to conduction band or maybe closer to balance band or maybe in the center wherever I mean that like gold has two levels one closer to the valence band the other closer 
this but they are fun there that's a very interesting material so what happens if there is you add additional impurity in which allows you to have a an allowed band this is allowed energy level in the band gap these are called traps these are called traps is that one clear what does traps traps are essentially now what trap was used for what if there is an and the point which i am saying is here is very important this energy level is such that its k vector is long, long enough in the sense this level translates into many k values is that correct? that's our assumption many materials show so so we say it is there in that case what can happen i show you four processes and if this is say let's say called electron trap the electrons may first fall to this trap and let us say then if the k has larger value then the electrons then fall to the valence band may show you light if the trap level does not have all k vectors possible then it will still not show you light it may do two step transitions two step recombination one is from the conduction band to the trap level and from trap level to the valence band but let us say by making some interesting material inside the trap is such that it has energy level which has all k possibilities this is what we did when we make created silicon device which emits light with which material could do this nitrogen it bonded if nitrogen binding is not very easy every time it bonded can give a level which is what i am now showing so silicon with some kind of nitrogen plus some precursor is required further more details some other day then there is a possibility silicon device is showing light what will be the wavelength of the light coming the energy with which it will fall so eg minus et will be the energy for which light may be seen so if i can adjust et values okay then i may get wavelengths of different if there is a direct combination combination going on where momentum is satisfied then you may see a light of this new energies okay this is what we are essentially doing in creating silicon what we call leds if possible some of them we succeed some of them we don't okay so one catch you must remember say the emitted light has something to do with this energy through which recombination takes place the wavelength is related to that the light which is coming out is that correct eg is equal to sc by lambda so the wavelength of light is sc by eg so if i want a yellow color if i want a red color or this i must find what what i should look for correspondingly a material whose eg is for that wavelength so the question was asked and you should also ask if you go to a LED devices lab or circuit lab we use leds So what's so wrong if I paint it by yellow or paint it by red? Why you say LEDs are red LEDs, yellow LEDs, or green LEDs, but not blue LEDs, which now came very recent? The reason is to get an EG of your choice is not very. This is called band gap engineering, and if you can do some band gap engineering with k infinite possibilities, then you may get different colored lights coming out of even silicon indirect band gaps. is that clear to you this situation is called essentially newer optical devices which are coming are essentially governed by this engineering called band gap engineering so there is another area of devices which is more related to optics or related to what we call opto electronics or photonics as the new word jargon mein rehna in my time i used to call opto electronics so log haste photonics now it's a big name okay big money big name so any proposal i make to government or anyone i must not write i am looking for electroluminescence i should say it has a photonic material which has a photonic band gap something same thing in a different way i say samne wale ko aata nahi hai unke ye naam sirf google se pata lagte hain 
they give money to you. Okay, that's why the projects are essentially attained. Okay, so is that point clear? So the direct band gap, indirect band gap materials, and there uh, are essentially the cause of different light coming out of it. And in normal case, what we are saying that the recombination process is essentially through a trap, then it is called trap assisted recombination. What is it called? Trap assisted recombinations. Trap is allowed energy state. in a band gap. So, there are possibilities that there is a direct recombination possible, but there may be, if there is no direct possibility, let's say EG is too high or let's say EG is too small, depends on either case. The recombination may still take place through trap and traps are always present by some way or the other whether you like the or you don't like there will be always traps present how many kinds of traps do you believe we can have trap is essentially where electron or hole can actually reach that state probability of electron reaching to a trap level will be highest when where the trap level should be near the conduction band. It's more likely hole may be trapped if the balance band, uh, trap is closer to balance band. Now the question arises, if electron has to be captured by the trap, what kind of trap it should be? It should be neutral. That means it has no charge of itself. So whenever it will receive an electrons, it will become negatively charged. Is that clear? Similarly in the hole, what kind of this should be? It should, no, it should be actually negative, the charge there, when the hole reach there, it neutralizes it. Is that correct? The trap level for a hole is the one when a negative charge trap near the balance band picks up a hole, because otherwise hole coming up there is very unlikely. Or this electron falling down is essentially hole coming up. So that whole trap is normally negatively charged. Electron traps is normally neutral. Is that clear? This is how we say traps are neutral or charged traps is what we look in. Electron accepted, then it becomes negatively charged trap. Holes accepted, it becomes neutral trap. Okay, charge will be actually removed from there. Is that point clear to you? So this traps are also depends on how, now what we'll see. The trapping will be, we'll see, derive that expression later. Trapping will be proportional to how many things? Firstly, how many carriers you have? It may ask that it is proportional. Then it will be proportional to probability of this, this ETK upar. It may probable have upper carriers trap honeka, the distribution function that you have. And then how, how many traps are actually density here? It depends on actually trap density. It also depends on the probability of occupation and it also depends on the number of available carriers and it also depends on some interesting constant which is proportionally constant we say that if the carrier, let's say this is a sphere and this is trying to capture. Okay. Let's say this is a circle and a carrier is coming and to be trapped. So the area, which is called divergence as we say, the area in which it can be captured is called cross-sectional area. It may be spherical, but the section which it sees where it can be captured is called as cross-sectional area. So trap density, cross-sectional of the traps, the probability of occupation and the available carriers where they can be trapped, all this will decide the recombination term R, how much recombination. Is that clear? Is that point clear? Through the trap, R will be proportional to how many things? The cross-sectional area. Larger the area, obviously they will more likely to be trapped. Smaller the area, less cross-section means they may pass through or sideways. So larger area means larger trap cross-section. So number of traps, number of possibility of occupation where trapping can happen with distribution, 
then the cross section area and the available carriers only can be tapped. If there are no n is very small, how many? They, only those many can be tapped. Nt may be infinite, but n is ten, so only ten can be tapped. So proportional to all this. So the combination term has many many interesting features. I would like to see how much actually is the recombination. So whenever carrier comes, it has an electric field. And it is going to be trapped. Okay. So what your model is, whenever electron is up capturing, it has an electric field sphere around it, where it is trapped. Actually, gives any direction because one cannot say which direction electron is going to come. So there is a sphere of influence where electron will be absorbed. Okay. Now, if, if I am seeing electron coming from here, and this is the sphere. So the area of which this electron sees is the cross-sectional area of the sphere, as if I cut it. Any electron which hits this surface will be absorbed. Correct. So essentially, imaginary, but that number has something to do with the property of the uh, trap material. How many, they, what the influence field it can create is a property that we express in terms of equivalent cross-sectional area. Is that clear? The fictitious may be, but it is something related to that material. This is constant. That's why they say proportionally constant, which essentially says as if it is proportional to area where it can be easily captured. But material, because the charge on every material inside a lattice will be different. Like six, uh, 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 six group element will have two electrons for that. Three may have one less. So depends on what material is around. The electron capture will be. Is that clear to me? This is this is what the transport layer all three are talking now. That electrons are actually influenced by the electric field through when it moves through a lattice. This is another way. Okay. So having said this, that traps can also assist you to recombination. We'll derive that expression afterwards. But let's remember there can be direct recombination or there can be trap assisted recombination. So we say either way the recombination will take place. Generation could be either through photo, electron beam, current, even thermal. That is what nature is. So any process can generate. That the recombination could be either of these, and they will recombine. And what is the purpose of recombination? Otherwise, that generating term will keep making it infinite. Okay, so it must be balanced to bring the system back to equilibrium. So let's start some more calculation on time. Let us say the. They call G N as generation for generation rate as we call for electrons and G P. Some ca write capital also you can write. It really depends on generation rate for holes. In normal case, in normal case one assumes, and many cases at least in silicon it is valid. G N is equal to G P. But this is not hundred percent true for all materials and all semiconductors. Okay. So in that case, for electrons you must use different G, and for holes you should use different G. As of now, we will assume this. Let us say initial carrier concentration. Let's say I have a semiconductor bar. Okay, let's write this. Okay, before we with this, if S H D would have been less than E G, what would have happened? It would have just absorbed. Okay, H D would have a shining light. It cannot excite whole electrons, so it will be absorbed, and mostly it will form heat. Okay, it will form heat. So if you keep shining the light, which has lower this uh, energy, it will keep heating the material. That's what most people we do when we say heat optical heaters or light heaters. Okay? It just shine light on them okay? of that level which is not coming out, so no luminescence, so it heats. Okay. okay, so let us say I have a material which has concentration of n zero, and I am shining light. Okay, and it creates whole electron pairs. So we say n zero plus excess carriers. 
delta n and delta p are the ehps okay delta in n is the excess carriers the new concentration will be equal whatever your thermal equilibrium value plus whatever is excited by the light please remember this carriers what i said because i say if it is whole electron pair excess electrons must be equal to excess ehp whole electron pair so it will always be equal to this if it is a p type material uh, there are since there are some n0 how much will be holes n i square by n0 so a new p now will be p0 plus delta p or delta n also and then we may replace delta n by delta so holes concentration increased by delta p or same as delta n electron concentration has increased from its equilibrium value n0 by delta n. now our first assumption in solving is why i put this delta what does that mean n0 is compared to n0 this number is smaller if this number is larger n0 p0 will not have any influence they themselves will decide the carrier concentration if delta n is large twice n0 or thrice n0 it is that number which you are going to talk but essentially we say the recombination will not allow that much so we say delta n essentially is less than n0 please remember i keep saying i will replace delta n delta p now take a case how much is the change and that's very important for us because that will tell us which carriers are relevant for us an example number wise maybe i'll give you to you that number before i do further calculations i have chosen a p semiconductor let's say p0 is 10 okay to make it point clear 2% to power 16 per cp by this number 1.5 square so <laughs> So n zero is n i square by p zero, which is ten to power four per c. Okay, is that clear? N zero p material n zero is very small, p zero is very large given to us. And let us say I shine light, and uh, number of carriers delta n equal to delta p. is 10 to power 14 per c the electron hole pairs which are generated due to the shining of h nu is 10 to power 14 per c so how much is n sorry how much is p now 2.25 into 10 to power 16 plus 10 to power 14 per c see of course and which essentially means Third, this is if I make 16, so this is 0.01 into 10 to the power 16. If I add, this becomes 2.26 into 10 to the power 16 per c. But what happens to n? What happens to n then? N is equal to n zero plus delta n. 10 to the power 4 plus 10 to the power 14, which is 10 to the power 14 per c. So, in a p-type material, which carriers are really have become large enough now? Electrons. What has happened to p-type? Practically, very small change. 10 to the power 16, 2.25 became 2.26. there are electron concentration was 10 to the power 4 now it has reached 10 to the power 14 is that correct so which carriers have now dominance the minority carriers the electrons which are minority in p have become now dominant carrier because change in p is very small compared to change in n is that correct so the change in n which is for minority carriers in p type is becoming some important quantity now is that clear 
he is not changing very much but n is changing drastically so if any phenomena when you recombine them will happen it is this electron recombination which will start as a dominating effect for you is that clear and that essentially means that minority carriers become very very important in non equilibrium situations is that what clear when i keep saying earlier why minority carriers are dominant in process of transports because that number may change which may have more influence than the change in the majority carriers and that therefore we say minority carrier transport is in most bipolar devices i say will be more dominant effect than in the case of mass where we say okay some need it okay we'll come back to that so this fact that the number changes drastically for the minority carriers is the crux of all the work which we do is that clear is the crux now calculate okay this number this is only a calculation so there is nothing more about it this is part of the way numbers you will like to see okay so i already written that relationship let us say this has time dependent term at any time t when the light was shining n t will be equal to n n0 is constant that is a thermal equilibrium value so n0 plus delta n t this now we are interested in the net change of electron concentration so we say p and t by dt is how much the the rate change of electron concentration will be proportional to what the change in actual available concentration so how much was initial concentration in normal case sorry proportional to in thermal equilibrium it was n i square minus n t how much is new call carrier concentration n t and p t is that correct so therefore is proportional to available electrons proportional to available holes so it is n t p t into alpha is the rate change occurring because of this but what was initial thermal generation rate proportional to n i square so what is the difference from the thermally generated to optically generated the difference is the carriers which can decay what is the nt actually we are talking it is essentially the excess carriers because n0 is fixed when i differentiate that goes anyway so i can even replace this uh letter and this constant dnt by dt is a given a constant recombination constant alpha r okay n i square and what should i write now ntpt let's write this expression for ntpt n0 plus delta n i won't put t here just it is always there p0 plus delta n or maybe write now if you wish delta p alpha r n i square n0 p0 plus delta n p0 plus delta p n0 plus delta n delta all are minus so which term cancels here this and this will n0 p square and and thermal equilibrium they cancel so delta n is small so we are assuming it will larger okay the square of delta n in delta p is also smaller in that's what the number proportion to the normalized value so we actually mean this if delta n is equal to delta p then it is alpha r sorry minus alpha r delta n n0 plus p0 is that okay n0 plus p delta n is same as delta p so delta n into n0 plus p0 minus sign is taken out however we also said how much is n0 p0 related normally in n type semiconductor or p type semiconductor one of them will dominate then we will say this is minus alpha r please remember 
If it is a p-type semiconductor, p0 will dominate. Is that clear? In the n-type semiconductor, holes dominate. In a p-type semiconductor, electrons will dominate. And which carriers we are talking here? In a p-type semiconductor, this was material for p-type, which carriers BK are more interested in? Minority. Which are minority in p-type? Electron. So I am looking for electron which is minority in p-type. So I say p0 is larger than n0 because it's a p-type material. So I neglect in terms of this. So I get minus alpha r p0 into delta n. Now this equation, how do we solve such simple equation, differential equation? What is the solution? Yes? Okay, let me first keep it. So d and t can be also written as delta and t by dt. d n by dt can also be written as because n0 plus delta n, n0 is constant, so d n0 by dt is 0. So that is equal to minus alpha r p0 delta n. We define a term tau n0 as alpha r is Alpha r as a unit such that 1 upon alpha r p0 as a unit of time in which case this equation d delta n t by dt equal to minus delta n by tau n0. Is that correct? Right? This tau n0 is called minority carrier lifetime, which is my by called minority here because electrons are in minority. It is electrons which are minority, the carrier lifetime. What is the lifetime word should be used for? The time, average time taken before electron recombines is like its lifetime, how long it will survive. So if you define this, what is the solution of this quickly? Delta nt is equal to how much? Minus a by, jaldi jaldi bolo. Just for the help of it, if it would have been n type semiconductor, what equation I would have got? D delta pt by dt is equal to minus tau p0 delta p and how much will be tau p0 there? 1 upon alpha r and if the material is other kind, holes would have been in the minority and equivalent equation could be written for the same case. Yes, solution kya bhi bolo na, it's a simple differential equation hai. So, I have to initial condition. Chahiye na. So, at t is equal to 0, uh, we call this number delta n at 0 is delta n, fixed value. So, that is delta n. In that case, the solution will become yes, delta n is equal to capital delta n e to the power minus t by tau n. Okay? If that is the initial condition, t is equal to 0, the carrier concentration is delta n. How does it look if I plot it? How will I look this expression? If I plot excess carriers concentration delta n or delta p whichever I draw, if you call it this, this is my, which was this material p type, so this was p0, this was n0, let us say this number 
is delta n and how will it decay exponentially they will start decaying with okay the, this side is e0 is only this much delta n will be same as delta p for the p is equal to so their decay is So there is hardly any real decay happening for p holes because the material is p kind. But what is strongly decaying, and where it will go to? Which value? It will go to its equilibrium value. And sometimes we define this value as n p zero. What does this n p zero means? Electrons in p at thermal equilibrium. Is that correct? Electron in P at thermal n zero is same, but n p zero may be more relevant because we say electrons in minor. Is that what here? Electrons are minor in P. So say n p zero is the equilibrium carrier concentration of electrons in P semiconductor. By same argument, it will be P n zero. Minor the whole concentration in n material at equilibrium. Is that? So books actually keep changing this. So I just thought if you see other book, they may have written instead of n zero n p zero, which is essentially same. So this decay which you obtain essentially now says that depends on what is the tau n zero by mass. Wherever this sixty six percent of the value. Wherever this decay will occur, 66 percent, that is called characteristic time, and that time we defined as minority carrier lifetime. If it is larger, what will happen? If the carrier lifetime is very high, so what does that mean? This will take long time before it will go to equilibrium concentration. If the minority carrier lifetime is very small, very very small, it may actually decay as fast. This is very relevant. Whether we want to keep electrons or minority carriers for longer time in particular regions or a shorter time depends on what we are actually looking from the device. For example, a transistor. If you want it to actually have a higher gain, okay, we may say the electron lifetime in NPN transistor in P base should be large enough. If the lifetime of electrons in the P base is large enough, we can show you later that the gain beta will be very high. However, since it is long enough, it will move very slowly as if. And therefore, what will it do? The if you are looking for a change of positive to negative, it will take long time before it will recombine. So the device will become slower in its switching operations. So I will do two things. One is lifetime has two influence. One on the gain, the other is on speed. So high speed करना है तो क्या करना चाहिए? Lifetime कम करो. The lifetime कम किया तो gain भी कम हो गया तो क्या चाहते हैं इसको बोलते हैं डिजाइन वॉट डू रियली नीड यू आर लुकिंग फॉर हाई स्पीड सर्किट्स थोड़ा लो पावर पे रहो ओके लो लो स्पे रहो अदरवाइज इट कैन नॉट सिस्टेम ओके सो थिंक ऑफ इट वॉट एसेंशियली यू आर गोइंग टू डू वेन द डिवाइस सो दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर आर